Welcome everybody to this week's Dornsife Dialogues. It seems like a lifetime ago now that we were living in a normal pre-COVID world. And as the weeks have passed, the majority of the reports that we've been getting don't seem to paint a much clearer picture, um, not of either the virus itself or of the impact it's having on nearly every aspect of our lives and society. But our team here at USC Dornsife has been using some of the most sophisticated social science methods and tools out there to help us make sense of what's going on. You might remember back in 2016, there was one poll that consistently pointed to the likelihood that Trump would win the election, while nearly every other poll out there predicted a Clinton win. That poll came from the Understanding America survey run by our own Center for Economic and Social Research, or CSER. Back in March of this year, the at the request of our city and county, the same team launched a rapid response study of the impact of the COVID pandemic in Los Angeles, supported by, by USC. The survey was quickly expanded across the country with the generous support of the Gates Foundation to become the Understanding Coronavirus in America survey. Leveraging years of top-notch work, this survey has been able to monitor the changing impact of COVID more quickly and in more detail than most other polls. And it has rapidly become a leading resource for data-driven insight into the pandemic's fallout. Today, we are joined by members of this STAR team to hear about what they're learning from the poll. I have the pleasure now of introducing to you the director of the Center for Economic and Social, Social Research, Professor Ari Kaptein. Professor Kaptein is a research professor of economics and his expertise covers microeconomics, public finance, and econometrics. He was previously at the RAND Corporation where he was a senior economist and director of the RAND Labor and Population. Our research team will be today in conversation with our moderator, Maeve Ward. Maeve is the Deputy Director for North America Public Engagement and Insights at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she has spent the past seven years. Before joining the foundation, she spent nearly 15 years as a public opinion researcher at the Hart Research Associates. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. I'll turn the program over now to Maeve to introduce the rest of our panelists. Dean, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for including me today. I'm so excited to be here to talk through the results of this poll. At the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we have contributed nearly $250 million over the past six months toward coronavirus response and relief. But we believe very strongly that because none of us have ever experienced anything like this before, we cannot start to move forward to recovery without understanding how coronavirus is impacting uh, Americans and how Americans are experiencing effects of the virus. So, uh, that is why we feel that it is so important to fund research like the research being conducted through CSER right now. So Ari, I'd like to begin with you and ask you a few questions. Can you take a moment to introduce us to the Understanding Coronavirus in America survey? Thanks, Maeve. Uh, Mike, can you show the first slide? So the answer is a little complicated, so bear with me. I'm gonna show you two slides that hopefully give you an impression of how we're doing this. So it starts with uh, the Understanding America, America study, which also Dean Miller uh, referred to. So that's a panel of households of about 9,000 households all over the United States. And they answer our questions online. It's an internet panel. But importantly, we cover the whole population. And the way we do that is that we invite people by sending them letters. And if they don't have internet, we actually give it to them. So anyone who doesn't have internet gets computer, tablet, and broadband internet from us. And that helps us to cover those people who don't have internet at the start of the, of the survey. So in, within that context, we then started doing the COVID-19 survey in March. Mike, you show the next slide. So the way this works is that um, every day about 500 respondents in our panel, in our Understanding America study, are asked to answer a number of our questions. And we do this for 14 days. So we get to about 7,000 answers over two weeks and then the process repeats. So we keep doing this every two weeks. Uh, one of the things we do is that is we graph their answers in a number of uh, graphs that we post on the website every day. And actually we post about 3,000 new graphs every day. And on the right, you see an example of what this looks like. And I'll actually come back to this figure a little later, but so the way this works is if you look at this graph every day, one dot gets uh, added on the right hand side. So each day there's a new data point as we call it and this then expands over time and 
as I said, there are many other graphs that you can then look at and, and see uh, what's going on in the world. Thank you. One of my responsibilities at the Gates Foundation is to collect and collate, aggregate, and analyze all of the public opinion data that is out there right now. And let me tell you, there is a lot of it. What is it that makes the understanding of America uh, and the understanding coronavirus survey from USC different from all of that other data? I think in terms of surveys, we probably know more about our people and also we were earlier. So we started in March and so Mike, maybe you can show the third slide. So I'm gonna illustrate the fact that we were early by two examples. And this, this example is a little uh, elaborate. So it takes a few slides to make the point but I think it also produces some information that's of interest in its own right. So at the, at the top, you see um, the statement that says the official unemployment rate in April was 14.7%. And that number was published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, on May 8th. So they talk about April, they published on May 8th. If you look at the graph here, the graph here shows people who had a job, who say at some point, I have a job. And it starts, uh, as, I'm not sure you can see the, the dates, but it, you know, I'll tell you what it is. So it starts on March 16. And the reason why it starts on March 16 is that every dot represents uh, an average of seven days. So we started on March 10, so March 16, we had the first observation about the number of jobs. Now in March, you see this go up and wiggle a little bit. And the reason is that at the end of March, we didn't have many observations, not many respondents. So it's a little, it's a little uh, you know, unclear, but if you look at the data, you analyze them, it's very easy to see that compared to early March, early April, 20% of people had lost their job. And so first of all, we see this early April rather than in May, but also of course, our 20% is much more dramatic than the 14.7% that uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, posted. So what I wanna do is talk a little bit about why I think our number is right and why I think we saw this earlier. So Mike, will you show the next slide, slide four? So I'm looking at a few other sources of information. So there is a group at Harvard called uh, Opportunity Insights and they collect, they really harvest data from whatever they can find at the census, you know, credit card information, all sorts of other information they can find. And they post this. And so here's a graph of consumption expenditures. And as you can see, and it starts early January and it sort of goes along and it doesn't really move much. And then around May, March 15, a little later, it falls off a cliff and actually it falls by at least 30% and then later on it sort of recovers a little bit. So there is this enormous, drop in what people are spending at the end of March. Mike, you show the next one. And here's another graph, and that's the number of hours people work in small businesses. And as a matter of fact, it's the same time pattern. So again, mid-March, things start falling apart. And you see actually at the bottom that 60, this is 60% drop. In other words, less than half of the hours worked in early March are still available in April. So it's another one that, should, that shows that really things happened much earlier than the official statistics uh, would us believe. Now, of course, then you go back and you ask yourself, you know, how is it possible that the Bureau of Labor Statistics report 14.7%? Uh, and if you read their documentation, it's pretty clear that the, they also think that the two unemployment rate is actually close to 20. And that has to do with uh, instructions to interviewers and how interviewers interpreted questions and so say them, they themselves estimate that some, something like 5 million people were incorrectly classified. So, you know, this is by itself, you know, sounds as harsh criticism at the same time, it's sort of laudable because they really were very open about what happened and they deliberated whether or not they would change the, the unemployment number, but then they decided to be consistent uh, with what they've always done in the past. But uh, they're very open about it, but I think it's also clear that Really, the unemployment rate has been 20% in April, and it started much earlier than people uh, people thought. So, I'll, I'll have a second, which is actually quite brief. So, Mike, you showed in the next one. So, in March, uh, based on the data that we collected early March, we looked at who was most likely to be the victim of uh, of the the pandemic. And uh, this is just a screenshot of the blog. But if you look at the next page, the next slide, Mike, can you take slide seven? Then, so one of the things we asked is, you know, would you be able to work from home if necessary? And this is by education. So you see if someone has GED or less, then only 16% or so say they can work from home. But if you look at people calls and above, you get to a 58%. And of course, we know now that since then, 
Previous lower education, minorities, lower income, there the unemployment rate has gone up to about 30%, whereas the top, the higher educated is maybe 10%. So we pointed early on uh, at the enormous uh, disparate effect that you would find across different groups. And of course, nowadays it's sort of common knowledge, but I think at the time that was still something that hadn't sunk in yet. Definitely speaks to the importance of being out early with this sort of data. Right, I think of that, yes. Uh, Ari, I have two more questions for you before we bring in your colleague, Jill. And the first is from my past career as a public opinion researcher, I know that one of the hardest things to do is to figure out which questions you're going to ask out of the whole universe of things that you could inquire about. How have you gone about uh, narrowing down the field to the list of questions that you're including? I think the honest answer is in a rush. Right, because we really wanted to get out in the field, so we didn't have a lot of time, you know, to think about this carefully. But it seemed clear that there are three main dimensions that you want to worry about in this case, which is the economics, people losing their job, health, mental health, and physical health, and then behavior. Do people change their behavior? So these were the three main elements. And we have kept this in, but then since then, you know, we've changed questions, we've added questions based on what, what suggestions that we got from other people using the data, saying, well, this isn't quite right. So it's still a dynamic process, so we keep changing things, but the main gist hasn't really changed. And a, a moment ago, you gave credit to the Bureau of Labor Statistics for being open about some of their methodologies. Uh, and you're doing something different with the understanding coronavirus survey in America, in that you're making it available in real time to researchers and the public. Can you talk to us a little bit more about uh, why you decided to do that and what some of those benefits are? Uh, well, in some ways, I think one should defend not doing it, right? It seems to be unconscionable not to make these data available as soon as possible to as many people as possible. And for example, right now, we have more than 50 research groups around the world using the data. And you know, we could never do that ourselves. So if we were to keep the data and sit on it, you know, we would really waste all the effort that, that we have put into this. And we're still expanding. We still want to have more data. So I think the bigger the research community using the data, the better it is for research but also for policy, we'll learn more and I think we'll have a better chance of doing the right thing. I think that's correct. And I, I'll, I'll add as an aside that Gates Foundation grants often make that a contingency of our grants. Uh, and um, we've never had someone as open as you about doing that. So that's been really a wonderful way to work with you on. Uh, so thank you, Ari. I would like to uh, now bring in your colleague, Jill Darling, who's the survey director for the Understanding America survey. Uh, Jill, welcome. Thank you, uh, glad to be here. In mid-March, the survey believed that very few Americans, uh, or found that very few Americans believed they had been infected. How has that changed since that first survey wave? Yeah, so it's true that when uh, we started this in early March, um, people were really not thinking about themselves being infected. Um, we, you know, we have a kind of a baseline for it just getting started. Um, however, we did find that worry about being infected started to spike upwards a bit as time went on and then kind of tailed off again. So I can show you some graphs from our COVID-19 website, uh, tracking site that illustrate what I mean. So um, for example here, this is the percentage of people who think they're infected with coronavirus. They haven't been in, uh, tested or diagnosed. You can see it's a fairly small percentage. It's going between 1% and maybe 4%, but it's starting off in this kind of low level, but people are feeling like maybe they were, maybe they weren't. There was a lot of talk about maybe I've had it in December. <laughs> there was that terrible flu. And then you can see that it kind of has now, as time has gone on from the left uh, being the middle of March and the right being the end of May, this has tailed off over time. And then if you put up the next slide, please, um, slide 12. The green line are uh, the percentage of people who have told us that they, they have actually been diagnosed with coronavirus, whether or not they had a test, because remember early on, people were not being able to be tested very much. Um, and that has been kind of a steady line of, of people that got a little higher. This is a cumulative number. So really, um, it would, if you were accumulating this, you would see it going up a little bit uh, to about maybe, a, I think we have about 3% total now. Um, but this is just looking back over the past 14 days in here. But then now if you go into slide 13, um, this line, we started asking if people had been tested and what you see here, the percentage are telling us that they have been tested. And as that line goes up, you see that orange line tailing off 
of people believing that they're getting it. The tests are out there. We know a lot more about it. And so there's really, I, I think, uh, you know, just sort of a changing uh, relationship to, you know, feeling afraid about it. Yeah. And when you talk about feeling afraid about it, what kind of changes have you seen happen in behaviors through the survey? Yeah, so we have actually seen several interesting trends um, that I could spend like a whole the whole time on it. So I'm just going to pick out, pick out a couple of things um, on slide 14. If you could put that up for us. Um, another slide from our website, this orange line are the proportion and now you're going to have to kind of shift your perspective because this is going from zero to 100. So the scale is much larger. Okay. So there on the left when we started measuring it about 75 percent were a little bit more than that were saying that they were staying home except for essentials or except uh, exercise and you can see that that has tailed off now at the end of may and it's down close just over 50 percent so that's a fairly hefty drop even though this looks like a gentle um, line here because of the scale that's mm -hmm. a pretty large drop and uh, so we're seeing that people are are not just staying home anymore and that's consistent with a lot of uh, other research that we've seen is as uh, health concern goes down, uh, yeah. people start to change behavior. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what are they doing instead? Um, if you put up slide 15 for me, please. People are starting to get out and about more. We can really see it in the data. That top black line is uh, visiting a grocery store or pharmacy. And you can see that really hasn't changed. People were getting out and doing that. They had to do it. Um, and that really hasn't changed. And uh, the bottom line there, the blue line, are people who have visited a bar, club, or other gathering place. That was pretty much at zero. It's starting to climb just a little there at the bottom. But I think the really interesting thing here is these two lines in the middle. You can't really see that there are two lines. One is orange and one is green. They're really close together because they're very similar because it's visiting um, with friends and neighbors at their home or having them come to you. And you can see that that is increasing quite a bit. Mm -hmm. That's going up from 22% who were telling us that they were doing that, you know, like seeing other people to more than 40% in the most recent data. So people are getting out. And uh, once again, this graph is going to be, these graphs are going to be really interesting to watch as uh, the, you know, states and counties and cities open up and we see what starts happening. So that was going to be my question for you. I know that survey data tell us what's happening now, not what will happen in the future. But as these states do start to open up, that will be really interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, how about changes in people's mental health? We talk a lot about uh, the physical effects of coronavirus, but what about mental health? Yeah, and so I sort of mentioned fear in the beginning. And, and what we really saw is that the onset of the pandemic really kind of set off a, a, a peak of um, concern. And, and there was a definitely a strong effect on people's mental health. Mm -hmm. So if you put up slide 16, um, this line shows the level of mild to severe psychological distress that we're measuring in the survey. And we have been measuring the same way um, since the beginning. You can see that it started a little bit below 30%. It spiked up to more than 45% in uh, March. And then it's been kind of tailing off ever since uh, going down that way. It um, that went up to a, a very uh, high percentage, and and we were sort of surprised to see that it really looked like you know people were in a lot of distress. And one of the really interesting things is that that is tailing off. Mm -hmm. And um, if you put up now the next slide, we'll have this breaks this apart. So overall, depression and anxiety are adding up to the mild to severe psychological distress. The black line is anxiety, and the green line is depression. So you can see that depression, um, I mean, anxiety, sorry, takes up sort of more of the spike. There's this, uh, people were feeling much more anxious, and then that started to tail off. Depression up a little bit, um, but sort of more general. And that kind of goes with the idea of people just facing an unknown. We didn't know what was going on. One thing that we really have found in some of the other work that we're doing uh, and we'll be releasing as time goes on is uh, that we see a real correspondence between increases in distress and job loss. So the people who were working and lost their jobs in that 
cliff that Ari showed in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, you know, really experience quite a bit more anxiety and distress, as you would imagine. Um, and then as people started getting unemployment insurance, that was a mitigator for that. We saw that distress went down for people who started having some income coming in in that way. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it, there's a lot of moving parts to this, but it definitely uh, had an impact. But I really do think it's very interesting how much that has tailed off. And remember, we're looking at the same people over time. These aren't cross sections, right? These are the right. same people telling us, you know, every two weeks how they're feeling and what's going on in their lives. I, I was about to say that's encouraging um, <laughs> to, the, to the degree that any, anything here is encouraging. Uh, what can you tell us about um, anything the survey demonstrates in terms of the disparate impacts of COVID on, on various communities? Yeah, um, there, there definitely are. I mean, people who, who were unable to work from home, um, people whose jobs were mainly in the service sector, they were hit the hardest, of course, when the job uh, market just, or the, the employment just dropped um, in that time um, that Ari showed in his slide and, and I've talked about before. So about one out of five Americans lost their jobs, as he was saying. And that is disproportionately the least educated and the lowest paid workers who were hit the hardest. Um, and in this pandemic, having a college education really makes a difference. Workers who did not have a college degree lost their jobs at twice the rate of people who have a degree. And um, I think that a, another pretty sad statistic is that four out of 10 workers who were working in the hospitality, dining and leisure industry lost their jobs. So retail workers, of course, were also hit. Uh, three out of 10 lost their jobs. I mean, there's just sort of on and on, but when you sort of look at the overall picture and you see statistics about the differential economic impact of the pandemic on various groups, honestly, most of that can be explained by economic status and the type of job that you have. Mm -hmm. And of course, as in any crisis, but in this particular crisis, because of the nature of the way that it hit the job market, um, the, those who were financially fragile to begin with just were least likely to be able yep. to shift to working from home and having some other way to handle this. And also the least likely to be able to collect unemployment. Well, thank you, Jill. Um, we'll come back to you in, in a few moments with any questions that uh, those watching might have. But now I'd like to bring in your colleague, Kyla Thomas, who's a sociologist and a researcher working with Ari and Jill. Um, and she's here to talk specifically about findings from LA County. Um, Kyla, the USC survey panel includes enough participants in LA County to generate statistically significant results regarding the impact in, in that area specifically. Um, so what can you tell us about how the pandemic has affected jobs specifically in LA? Right, so as you mentioned, one of the great benefits of our survey panel is that it includes this oversample of LA County residents. Uh, right now, approximately 1,500 LA County residents have consented to participate in our tracking survey, which has allowed us to make claims not just about the national population, but also about LA County specifically, and to support research efforts at the Department of Public Health. Um, and if you could, so if you could pull up slide 21. So, so one of those, uh, impacts that we've been able to track over time, of course, has been this nationwide drop in levels of employment that occurred, um, especially between March and April. What really caught our attention when we were looking at LA was how much bigger that employment drop was in LA. So rates of employment dropped uh, about 17 percentage points in LA County from 61% in mid-March to 44% in early April. And that's five uh, points higher than the 12 percentage point drop we saw in the rest of the country. Now we still have some work to do to explain this difference that we're seeing in rates of job loss. Our initial hypothesis was that the dominance of the service sex sector in Los Angeles might um, explain it, given the pandemic hit service sector jobs the hardest, as, as Jill just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we're finding that differences in industry composition do not appear to explain the difference. It seems that rates of job loss were simply greater in LA. 
Uh, it may be that the high cost of living in LA makes it more difficult for businesses to weather a, a major economic disru disruption, forcing uh, higher rates of layoffs. Um, but this, this is something we want to explore further. Hmm. And how about the finances of people living in Los Angeles compared to the rest of the country? Right, so if you could pull up slide 22. So along with the different rental rates we're seeing uh, in job loss, uh, we have, we've also been seeing different, differing levels of economic insecurity in Los Angeles County. Uh, so in general, levels of insecurity are much higher in LA, uh, largely because Angelinos were more uh, in a more precarious financial position at the start of the pandemic. So in every survey wave, we asked people to estimate the percent likelihood of running out of money in the next three months. Uh, across the US, we find that perceptions of economic insecurity increased in April and have since um, kind of steadily declined. Um, but you can see in the graph here that levels of economic insecurity are consistently higher in LA. Mm -hmm. So the time trend doesn't differ in LA compared to the rest of the country. Everyone is experiencing a similar um, change in levels over time. But LA is currently facing a relatively heightened economic distress um, because it was more distressed to begin with at, at baseline. And there, there are many reasons why LA might be more economically distressed. Uh, there's, there's greater economic inequality in LA compared to the national average. LA is simultaneously less well off compared to the national average, but then a more expensive place to live. About half of um, LA residents in our panel are, are renters compared to about a third uh, of the rest of the US um, and their rents are higher. So altogether, these conditions make LA residents more vulnerable to economic disruptions like a pandemic. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, LA was among the first counties to issue a stay at home order. Uh, what have you found in terms of um, whether people have stayed home and, and are they continuing to stay at home? Has that been consistent over time? Yeah, so, so we, we've tracked a bunch of uh, behavioral changes over time in LA and at the national level. Um, if you could pull up slide 24. Basically, we're seeing that while Angelinos uh, were less well positioned financially to handle the economic toll of the pandemic, um, they have been more diligent and timely in their efforts to keep themselves safe from the pandemic. Uh, so for example, in March, you can see that LA County residents were, were already more likely to be wearing masks uh, and changing their travel plans to avoid travel for leisure. Uh, and they continue to be more likely to engage in those types of behaviors, though we are seeing, I mean, we saw a dramatic increase over time in, in mask wearing uh, both in LA and in the rest of the US. And if you could pull up slide 25. Uh, here you see that L LA County residents are also more likely to, to be staying at home and avoiding public spaces. Um, and they are in some respects better positioned to lower their risk of exposure. We are finding that the uh, LA County residents are more likely to be able to work remotely. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this gap between LA and the rest of the US in rates of remote work is even starker actually among, the low, uh, among lower educated and lower income workers where we're seeing um, that they're, they're actually more likely to be able to work from home if they live in LA than if they live elsewhere in the country. So that's kind of an interesting hmm. um, difference. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Kyla. So uh, I appreciate that look at LA County in particular. And again, we can, we'll come back to you with questions in just a few moments. Um, I'd like to introduce one more uh, of your colleagues, uh, Anna Saavedra, who's another researcher and colleague who's been studying how the pandemic has affected education. Anna, welcome. Thank you, Maeve. Um, tell us about what are parents saying uh, about the education their kids are getting at home with most of the country's schools closed? So parents are reporting that their children are engaging in educational activities provided by schools, the majority of children. Um, but to echo a theme that we've been hearing recurrently, there's a really big sort of income differential um, in terms of what that, what the educational activities are looking like. Can we see slide 31, please? So in, in this slide, this is showing um, whether, whether a, a parent is reporting whether their child or children has interacted with their teacher. 
Um, so you can see that in households where um, the income is greater than $150,000, close to 90% of children are interacting with their teacher. But then if we look down that sort of income gradient, um, when children are living in poverty, just over half of them are interacting with their teacher. That's a really meaningful difference in what kind of education is taking place. Mm -hmm. um, we see a similar kind of gradient if we look, for example, at um, whether or not children are receiving feedback from their teachers. Hmm. And in, uh, with children home, uh, m most of the responsibility for making sure a child is sitting down and doing this work falls to a parent. So in, in, uh, in households with two parents at home, who is it who is um, doing those sorts of activities with their kids? Right, so in a word, it, moms. Um, can we see <laughs> the next slide, please? So kind of no matter how we cut it, we, we get <laughs> um, that, that mothers are really the, the primary, having the primary responsibility. So we asked who's mainly responsible for providing childcare while school is suspended or canceled. Um, and, and um, respondents could say me, me and my spouse, uh, my spouse. And so when we look at um, house households with spouses living together, um, even among employed mothers and fathers, so 43% of employed mothers say that I'm the primary um, child care provider compared to 7% of employed fathers, for example. So this is, this is a, you know, a very stark gender contrast here. Um, these, these numbers aren't so, so different pre-pandemic. Um, the big difference, of course, is that children are at home all day, every day. <laughs> it's always gratifying for me when the survey data validates the experience in my house. <laughs> um, so with um, kids who have missed so much of the school year, um, what are parents saying about their concern for whether kids will be ready for the next school year? Right. So around 40% of parents um, feel that their child is just not learning as much as they would have with schools opened. Um, if we look at concerns, so around a quarter of parents are concerned about their child's preparedness for next year. Um, if we look, start looking at some racial differences, um, we have Hispanic families, um, around a third of Hispanic families concerned that their child won't be prepared for next year, um, voicing concerns about lack of access to instructional materials, lack of that, those interactions with teachers that I referenced before. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at some other groups as well, uh, we're, we're hearing some really serious concerns among students who, uh, parents of students who are receiving special education services because they have a, um, a cognitive or a physical disability. Um, children who are receiving mental health services, they're around half of those parents are voicing concerns about their child's academic preparation. Mm -hmm. um, we are hearing from around half of parents as well that they hope that there'll be summer school offerings for all for all children. Um, and I, there's been quite sort of disparate district responses around the country. Um, so there isn't sort of a trend among all districts to be providing summer school. I can say as an LAUSD parent, we just received our notice last week um, inviting all LAUSD parents to sign up their children for summer school offerings. Um, so that's the LAUSD policy. Hmm. Uh, uh, and each of your colleagues who've already spoken have mentioned something about disparate impacts of COVID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ensuring that all children have access to a high quality equitable education is, is really important. Uh, what are you seeing about the different ways that COVID is affecting families who were already disadvantaged coming into the pandemic? Um, I think that's slide 34, maybe. Um, thank you. Um, so, right, so there's so many ways in which we're observing these disparate effects. Um, and like you said, for um, disproportionately for, for the people and students and children who are already disadvantaged. So um, in this figure here, we're showing drops in school services. Uh, we see the most stark, um, severe drop there for meal provision. Um, so around um, 40, so parents reported, around 40% of our parents reported that in February, their child was receiving free or reduced price meals. But by the end of April, that number had dropped to just over 20%. That's almost a 50% decline um, in meal provision. And actually we saw a um, the, the front page story in the New York Times yesterday about child hunger and about how food is not getting out to the children who need it. Um, 
we're seeing reductions in services for all sorts of children who ha were receiving them in February and then weren't by the end of April. Special education services, um, mental health support, struggling learner support, um, testing accommodations and supports for students for whom English is a second language. Um, so these are, these are all concerning trends. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now open for questions. Um, as Jim mentioned at the beginning, we do have um, a mechanism to ask questions and answers that is separate from the chat box. So please feel free to add a question uh, into, the, into the question and answer box. And I will get started um, by a question that was posed to Jill. Um, Jill, you mentioned that some of these who are most affected in these lower socioeconomic groups are less likely to receive unemployment benefits than other groups. Um, can you tell us about um, why that is? Can you take yourself off? Yes, mute? I am now. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that at least once on this call. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. All right. Well, I'm the one. So. <laughs> Um, we did find that people who are uh, in the sort of lowest uh, so socioeconomic categories had the largest gap um, sort of unfilled there between um, getting benefits and, and not. And there were a lot of reasons. We asked why um, that had happened and people told us that they were not eligible. Um, many had, uh, had been trying to apply and hadn't actually gotten um, any benefits yet. Some told us that uh, they just, um, you know, they didn't really know, they didn't really have a reason, like they just maybe weren't negotiating the system well. So there were a variety of reasons why. Great. Um, I have one question that I'm going to put on the table now for the panelists to be thinking about, and then I'm going to come back to you and pick on Ari with something different. Um, someone has asked about findings that were really surprising to you. Um, so if uh, Jill, Kyla, and Anna, if you could think about that. Well, Ari, I ask you, um, somebody uh, is curious about, given the political polarization in the country right now, um, how do you account for some of that polarization in how you're wording the questions for the survey? How do you make sure that you're not speaking to one or another sort of uh, uh, end of the spectrum? Well, we essentially don't ask opinions. So, you know, we ask about behavior. Are you wearing a face mask? What do you think? Are you going to run out of money? Do you have a job? So it's very little. Recently, we asked, we added a question where people were asked whether they thought that the opening up was going too quickly or too slowly. So that's an opinion. Mm -hmm. And it was suggested by one of our colleagues. But by a lot, we don't ask opinions. So it's a little hard, I think, for the respondents to then infer that we are after a particular uh, political bend. So, so we, we, you know, we really do try very hard to be as neutral as possible. And we've always done that because we really want to cover the whole population. So the last thing you want is to be seen by one group as well, he's really from this other camp and I don't really trust him. So, uh, so I, we don't really feel that there is any differential in whether people's, in, in people's willingness to answer our questions. Mm -hmm. And let me stay with you for just a moment and ask a couple of housekeeping questions that have popped up. Um, what was the total number of people surveyed um, in, in these various ways? It's, uh, I think it's a little less than 7,000. We right now we have almost 7,500 people willing to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still trickling in because, you know, sometimes people haven't uh, responded right away, but after a couple of weeks, they say, oh, this is a really great idea. So I think the most recent surveys are close to 7,000 over the two week period. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, and then we repeat. So then, then we interview the same 7,000 again uh, the next 40 days. And speaking of repeating, how long do you, uh, someone had asked, how long do you plan to continue doing this coronavirus study? Well, in the old days, one would call this a $64,000 question, I guess. <laughs> uh, there, has, there has been a little bit of inflation since the, this game show was around. Uh, we really hope to keep doing this as long as we can, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very expensive uh, activity. You know, so we're, we have, you know, we're very grateful for the funding we have received so far. We're actively uh, trying to acquire more funding. So the plan is really, the ambition is really to keep this, doing this as long as the pandemic is with us mm -hmm. uh, in one form or another. So the hope is as long as it takes. Uh, and we also have a question about what the survey throughout the United States was this a nationwide survey? Yeah, yeah. Everyone in the United States can participate, 
uh, anyone who has an address essentially, because whenever people have an address, they're eligible. We draw from the postal address of the United States, so we draw randomly. And if your address gets picked, then you're invited to be part of the survey. Great, thank you. Um, so let's go to this question now about what surprised you. Anna, can I, can I start with you for a, a surprise for you in the data? Well, it was a sad, um, a sad surprise, but it was really that drop in food services that I shared, um, in part because um, I, from just from following the daily education news, really from um, early March, um, really the first concern of districts was was providing food, mm -hmm. um, and there was there was just such a huge emphasis on that food food pr provision, you know, grab and go centers in LA, but really the same things were happening nationwide. So the the fact that food isn't getting to the children that's that's a big and sad shock. Yes, yeah, for sure. Uh, Jill, how about you? What was surprising? I'd say when we really first saw that cliff happening with the job loss and mm -hmm. how shocking it was to see that happen. I mean, when you see a, a change like that in your numbers in a survey, you just scramble around to make sure that that's real. Yeah. And Kyla? I mean, I, I agree with Jill, certainly the, the drop in employment and, and the fact that we saw an even uh, higher drop in employment in, in LA. Mm -hmm. I would say you know, that's something we're still trying to account for. Mm -hmm. um, and also the, the psychological toll, I would say, um, the, the spike we saw in early April and just the extent of it. Uh, in LA, we, I, I remember when we first reported our, our psychological distress findings, 47% of LA County residents were experiencing some form of psychological distress. That's just half the, the county population. That's pretty high. Yeah. Uh, Anna, Diane is wondering about anything, any differences that you saw based on the type of school that a child attends, whether it's a public school, a private school, a parochial school. Do you have any data to help answer that question? That's a great question. So we, we, started asking that question about what kind of school your child was attending more recently. Um, we know that over 80% of our sample, um, the children attend public school. So because of that, that means we have quite small groups of children that are um, uh, attending other sorts of schools. Um, that's one of our areas of digging in because it's a great question, um, but I can't speak too much to it quite yet. Great, stay tuned. Um, Ari, I'm gonna come back to you for this question. Um, Talk to me, please, about the benefits of doing an online poll as well as a panel, uh, a panel survey. What are the benefits of doing that versus other types of survey research? Uh, there's a, well, first of all, obviously, well, the panel, I'll start with the panel part. Uh, it's really useful to follow people over time for two reasons. We already know a lot about these people. We have many hours of interview time from the past. So when we look at what people say now, we can actually go back to what is said in the past. We know a lot about their socioeconomic status. We know a lot about the jobs and everything else. So we don't have to repeat these questions. We know already a lot about them. And the other thing is, as Jill suggested, if you look at changes over time, it's much more powerful to know that these are the same people. Otherwise you see changes and maybe the sample is a little different. You know, there's always a problem of so who is asking the questions. And here you know they are the same people, so you really know these are these are real cha real changes. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing about internet is there's sort of two things to be said about. First of all, in today's day and age, it's only one of very few possibilities. For example, face-to-face -face interviews are impossible, so the only alternative really would be telephone. And we know that telephone uh, response rates have gone through the bottom; they have really dropped off. And right now, if, if you were to start a telephone poll right now, you would get a response rate on the order of a few percent at most. So it's, it's very expensive to reach people. It's very difficult. And it's also then hard to, to even know what you get from the people asking the phone. So I think we have gotten to a point where internet is really the, the medium of choice. But then the important part is, of course, somehow make sure that you cover everyone. And that's why we do this whole thing with sending letters and follow-ups and giving internet to people without internet because we really want to cover everyone and not just people have happen to have internet uh, already. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen has asked a question that Ari, I'll go to you first and then give the other panelists an opportunity to weigh in. Um, uh, and it's a question that is dear to my heart as a funder. Uh, are you aware of any particular policies that have been informed by the data? You mentioned earlier 
uh, the number of, of researchers that you know mm -hmm. that are using the data already because of the way you've made it available. Um, can you talk about any of the different ways that you, you know the data are already being used to inform uh, recovery efforts or response efforts? No, I th it may, what I mainly know is, is people using the data and publishing about it. So we write blogs, we put out press releases. Uh, we know that policymakers look at it, but then you know, going to the next stage and now saying, well, policymakers have done this or that, that I think we're not quite there yet. And partly it's, it's a matter of time for people to sort of see the trends over time and learn more about what's going on. They're still expanding the database. So I certainly expect more of that in, in the near future, but I, we're not there yet. I, I'll just add to, to Ari's uh, response. Uh, every week I send uh, updated LA County data sets to the Department of Public Health and they have mm -hmm. Um, their their population, population health assessment unit is analyzing that data on a weekly basis. Um, we also included some questions in our survey that were designed by the Chief Sustainability Office at LA County um, to assess food insecurity in LA that when they, when they realized we were doing this survey, they were really excited about the data we were collecting mm -hmm. and they thought they could use our, our survey and our survey panel to assess um, levels of food insecurity and access to of food in LA uh, to inform their kind of budgetary, um, you know, uh, considerations, priorities. Mm -hmm. Anna, let me turn the question just a little bit and go to you. I'm sorry, Jill, and then I'll come right back. Um, uh, Anna, how, how would you hope to see school districts and other education decision makers use the data to inform their actions? That's a good question. So, well, I, I hope that parental input over time really does help to shape the kinds of policies, like for example, summer school. So if half of parents hope that all children are going to um, receive, you know, the opportunity to enroll in summer school, I hope that districts will, will hear that and, and include that among their plans. Mm -hmm. um, we also are going to be um, serving it again in June to ask about um, all sorts of questions about how parents continue to experience online learning um, through the spring and in the beginning of the summer, um, you know, what are parents' experiences with online learning directly with teachers? Do they like it? Do they want more of it? Um, we, we do hope that parental feedback can be a pretty important policy driver. Definitely. And Jill, I think you were trying to jump in a moment ago. Yeah, I was just going to add a little bit uh, about the policy. Um, I wouldn't say that I have more information about specifically like government policy, but I do get contacted a lot by people who are planning programs, both uh, at, like at the uh, public health level and in doing designing um, studies at universities and hospitals. And they often are interested in using our questions and seeing what, uh, what we found so far and how that can uh, be applied to their own populations. So, um, I mean, this is one survey in uh, a whole world of surveys and we have been very much cooperating with a lot of people. Uh, when we were first designing it, we put it together with help from people all over the world of thinking through what might be put on there and, um, and we have shared our instruments and been part of this kind of uh, worldwide gathering mm -hmm. of information. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a question, uh, Ari or, or Jill, you can take this one. Uh, someone, uh, one of our attendees is wondering about your intentions to do political polling this year, or are you planning to focus on the coronavirus? That's a question for Jill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I'm the pollster in the group. <laughs> so yes, um, Thanks to our, uh, our wonderful partners at the um, Center for the Political Future, it looks like we will be able to do some political polling, um, at least right before the election. Great. Uh, Kyla, I have a follow-up question for you. Could you discuss further the food insecurity component in LA that you just mentioned? Is there any data available on that yet? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, is it tomorrow that we're, uh, uh, our, our, our data set will be publicly available that includes uh, the, the food insecurity data for LA. Um, and I believe there are, um, are some funds to, to, to track, um, so to include some of those questions in future survey waves. Um, mm -hmm. we, we asked, so we are, had already included a few questions about food insecurity to assess um, kind of degree of food insecurity. Um, and that's always been in our survey and we've been tracking that over time, but uh, we added more questions to get at 
where, you know, where are people getting their food? Um, how far away are they traveling? Are, are they, you know, delivered to their home? Um, what, what, what is their level of awareness of food assistance programs? Those are the kinds of questions that we included. Um, and I, I believe, Jill, correct me if I'm wrong, but those will be um, uh, posted tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Great. I can speak to that a little bit too. Um, so among households with children, overall 13% um, say that school closures have made it harder to feed their families. And among the lowest income families, that number is 22%. Uh, I said earlier, and, and you all are very aware that surveys can tell you what's happening now, uh, much less good about what will happen in the future. But Josie is wondering about uh, the questions that you're watching to see real changes on. Um, if I can go to you one at a time, what, what are the, the variables or the questions that you are most interested in, in seeing um, how they move over, over the next wave or, or so? Um, Kyla, do you, is there something that you're watching? I mean, I think we're all watching employment. <laughs> I, yeah. I would say, uh, I mean, that's the big question is how long will it take us to recover from this? Um, and also how will people's behaviors change over time? How long is it going to take us? You know, I mean, we're all, we're entering these new phases and we're, uh, I mean, restrictions are being lifted. Um, but, you know, there's, but there's also this question of when will people feel safe enough to mm -hmm. step outside and, and dine in at a restaurant? Um, so I would say job loss and, and, and people's behaviors. Um, and also I, I am, you know, just because I do focus also on LA, I, I am kind of curious to see um, if there are differences uh, between LA and the rest of the US over time and how, and how they adjust um, and, and change um, their behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, Jill, what are you yeah. watching? Yeah, I would say that pretty much the same things. I mean, the behaviors are fascinating just from a, you know, a sort of a data geek, you know, standpoint of just having the numbers to go with what you hear on the news is fascinating. So that's what our tracking survey, um, you know, is, is something everybody can go visit. It's up all the time and it's updated and you can kind of see some of this happening in real time. Uh, and, and I think that that's really fascinating. And um, I'm also really uh, interested in something that we haven't really been able to do very much yet, just because we haven't had the time, but in looking at how um, these, are, these differences are, are uh, going on across the country, not just in uh, Los Angeles, but also uh, we have a, a great um, California state sample, and it'll be interesting to take a look and see what California as a whole is looking like. And also just regionally around the country, whether or not things are changing differently. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, watching those testing numbers climb, that, that's also another really interesting statistic that, um, that we have that we can sort of monitor how that's going. And Anna, before I go to you to sort of answer the last question, uh, Jill, you touched on something that Felicia is asking about, which is, do you have enough uh, data in any, any specific state or in any specific region to really examine that in more depth? Yeah, so California, we have a big sample in California, so um, we definitely can look there. We Some other states, we have fairly large samples, but honestly, we have not sampled them specifically to look at those states. Mm -hmm. But regionally, um, we have large samples and, you know, we, we will be looking at that. Uh, we can also do things like look at urban areas versus rural versus suburban, things like that, uh, which we will have very large sample sizes for and be able to do subgroups within those. So. That, that's all to, to come. <laughs> Great. And um, Anna, before we close, what, what's the data point that you're watching over the next couple of months? Uh, hi. Sorry, I had a little echo. Um, I'm interested to see what kind of policies, so, so it's really like a matter of watching policies and then watching parental feedback to those policies, and it's happening so quickly. So Mm -hmm. Summer school may happen, and that may change level of concerns. Um, another big potential policy intervention would be like intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring. If an intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring is rolled out, how might that change um, parental perceptions of preparedness and concern? So it's really kind of like a, a two-step process. But because there's so much going on in education policy, mm -hmm. um, that's what I, I'm interested in really 
in some ways hopeful. I mean, it's been a very, very sort of traumatic time for all, um, but there, there could be some hope with effective policy. And I'm so glad that I saved you for last so that we can end on that note of hope. Um, we are out of time. Thank you so much to all of the panelists for sharing what you've learned. And thank you for all of this really important work, understanding COVID impacts and experiences. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, to you and to Dornsley for having me here to moderate this conversation.